just continue to worship and just think about the wonderful, fairest Lord Jesus. Let's take some time and pray for our nation this morning, this wonderful, wonderful country God has graced us to live in. On this, our Independence Day, Lord, we do thank you. We do thank you this morning for the nation that we live in, Lord. Thank you for the United States of America, Lord. A wonderful, wonderful, graced land. And we are thankful today, Lord. We are thankful, Lord, for the amber waves of grain from sea to shining sea, for the grace and the goodness of this country, Lord, for founding fathers and mothers who were heroic and brave, for soldiers and for men and women and boys and girls who have made great decisions to follow you, Lord, all through these years of this land. We thank you that from this country, hundreds and thousands of missionaries have been thrust forth to the nations We thank you for that, Lord. We pray it would happen again, Lord. We thank you that this country has been made so wealthy and it has been able to bless so many poor, struggling lands, Lord. We thank you for that. That's good, Lord. We thank you that the gospel has deeply impacted this country. And we pray, and please join me, friends, in Jesus' name, in asking that the gospel would deeply impact this country again, Lord, for good, for the good of millions of people, for the good of the whole world, Lord. And Lord, we take time today and we pray for the president of this country, Joe Biden, Lord, I want to thank you that you had mercy on my soul. You saved me from sin and folly. You did that to me, Lord. And if you did that to me, you can do it to anybody. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that Joe Biden would know Jesus as his Savior. And that you would have mercy on him even as you had mercy on me. And Lord, in so doing, you would make him brave and noble and good. And he would hate evil and love what is good. And he would therefore be a great president of this great country. Have mercy and do this, Lord, please. Lord, we are humbled today. And Lord, we know that there is much evil. We know that there is much strife. Would you fill your church in this country with conquering love? And would you send to this land a sweet and a precious awakening, Lord, we pray. Turn us back to yourself. In Jesus' name. And would you join with me, friends, and let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, as we prepare our hearts for communion this morning, we're going to take bread and we're going to take wine this morning and remember the death of Christ for our sins. And as we prepare our hearts for that this morning, we're going to look at this passage 
from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, and we're going to gallop through it. But you have your Bibles, you can go home this afternoon and you can take time in it. And we're going to look in this chapter at the seven wonders of Jesus in this chapter. Now, the wonders of Jesus are infinite. We will spend eternity discovering the wonders of Jesus and you'll never get bored ever discovering the wonders of Jesus. But in this passage, there are seven amazing things about Jesus in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, what you think about when you think about Jesus is the most important thing about you. And the Bible is given so that we might think rightly about Jesus. Lord, please use the Bible in our lives to make us think wonderful things about Jesus. Now, the church in Colossae was getting bored with Jesus. I hope you're not. When you read the letter, you discover they were more amazed by angels and phenomenal things and rules and regulations. They were more amazed by those things than they were with Jesus. And Paul wrote this letter to Colossians saying, please, please just come back to Jesus. I want to ask you a question. If you came to Westbrook Church on a Sunday morning and the Bible was closed and it wasn't read, and we didn't sing amazing songs like Fairest Lord Jesus, and there wasn't a sermon about Jesus. And we didn't take communion to remember Jesus, but you saw an angel. Would your soul be fed? It would not. A thousand angels cannot equal one good song about Jesus. Please believe that with me. As a matter of fact, let me tell you something that concerns me on this Independence Day. The last time, the last time I said something from this pulpit that anyone applauded was last November when I said something about politics and it got applause from the church. But before then and since then, we've said a thousand wonderful things about Jesus. There's never been applause. That's not right. And we're going to hear seven things about Jesus very, very quickly this morning. You don't have to applaud because you feel guilty now. But you might want to think, hang on, if I applaud politics but I don't applaud Jesus, where's my soul? Paul wrote the Colossians saying, please come back to Jesus. Please. Because Jesus is infinitely wonderful. Number one, thing number one, Jesus is God. Look at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is God. Line up all the great people of history over here. Don't put Jesus with them. Jesus is here. You can put George Washington there. You can put Abraham Lincoln there. You can put all the great men and women who have ever lived. Great men and women. Thank you, God, for them. But here is Jesus. Jesus is God. If you walked up to Muhammad, who began Islam, and said, excuse me, Mr. Muhammad, are you God? He would say, that's blasphemy, and he'd cut your head off. If you went up to Gandhi, the great Hindu, and said, excuse me, Mr. Gandhi, are you God? He'd say, yes, of course I am, and so are you, and so is the squirrel, and so is the tree, and so is the sun. If you walked up to Buddha and said, excuse me, Mr. Buddha, are you God? He'd say, there is no God. He was actually an atheist and he started a religion. Jesus said, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one. God is, Jesus is not God in disguise, but God in display. If you want to know what God's like, read the Gospels. This is what God is like. The one who is the friend of sinners. The one who has mercy on the needy. The one who fed the hungry, who conquered sin, who conquered death. This is God. Number one wonder of Jesus in this passage. 
Jesus is God. Look no further, search nowhere else, and accept no substitutes. Jesus said of himself, I and the Father are one. Hebrews says, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Number two, I told you we're going fast. He is, in verse 15, the firstborn of all creation. Now that word firstborn means the preeminent one. The preeminent one, the boss, the Lord of all creation. Here is all creation, and here is Jesus, the Lord of all of it. In the Jewish world, the firstborn is the one who had all authority. Also, the one who had the wherewithal to rescue all the others when they got in trouble. So the firstborn son had authority, but also responsibility to rescue all of the children of the father who had made a mess of themselves. That was what the firstborn did. And that is who Jesus is. Absolute Lord over every created thing. And when you read the Gospels, you see Jesus. He was Lord over demons. He was Lord over sickness. He was Lord over death. He was Lord over the wind and over the waves. He is the preeminent firstborn Lord of everything. And Philippians says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you know, the one who is described in these five verses, nobody else is described this way in all of human history. And I would encourage you to try and exercise. Try, read these five verses, maybe this afternoon, maybe gather around as a family and do it, and think, Let's try to think of a being greater than the one described here. You can't. It's not possible to think of one greater than the Jesus described in these passages. Third, everything was created by him and for him. He's the creator of everything. Look at verse 16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. The entire, <coughs> the entire universe and any parallel universe, all things that are seen, all things that are unseen, get this, were created by and for this first century carpenter from Nazareth. And he holds everything together. This is Jesus. Do you know, I simply want to be known as a follower of Jesus. I know as Christians, we keep adding adjectives to what we describe ourselves. Every adjective you add to yourself weakens who you are in Christ. I don't want to be known as a Calvinist. I don't want to be known as a non-Calvinist. I don't want to be known as a charismatic. I don't want to be known as a non-charismatic. I don't want to be known as a this. I don't want to be known as a that. I want to be known as a follower of Jesus. And I want to spend my little life promoting the fame of Jesus who made all things. Visible and invisible. Thrones or powers. In him all things were made and are held together. The wonders of Jesus. Number four, this same Jesus is the head of the church. Look at verse 17. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the church, his body, He is the beginning and the end, the firstborn from among the dead. Now, when I say church, please don't think of a building. That's not very exciting to say Jesus is the head of a bunch of buildings. Who cares? Think of people. 
ruined people, hell-bound people, undeserving people, sinful people, whom Jesus has gathered and is gathering and is saving into a glorious thing called his bride, his body, his church. Think of that. From every tribe and tongue and nation is this Jesus saving people. Can I tell you that today, July 4th, 2021, the church of Jesus on earth will grow by 80,000 people. That's my Jesus. That's the one I want to follow and know. Now, I want to play a little exercise with us for just a moment. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's not scary. Nothing terrible is going to happen. I want to invite you for just a moment to close your eyes. Everybody, children, grown-ups, everybody close your eyes and imagine the most beautiful scene you can imagine. Okay? And we've done this before. Some of you might remember. Okay. The most beautiful scene you can imagine. Okay, we're done. Open your eyes. If your scene had people in it, will you raise your hands, please? Everybody look around. Raise your hands really high if your scene had people in it. About five of us, ten of us, okay? If you could say to God, and you can't, but if you could say to God, God, would you close your eyes for a moment and imagine the most beautiful scene you can imagine? Okay, God, open your eyes. I think God's scene would be all people. His whole scene would be people. From every tribe and culture and nation. Jesus is the head of this thing called the church. And it's all about people. And by the way, in that scene that God would imagine, the church of Jesus, the vast majority would not be white. It's just worth us knowing that. The church of Jesus, which is the biggest thing happening on earth, the vast majority are African and Asian, and we are the poor cousins We are. We are the poor cousins of this incredible thing that Jesus is the head of called the church. And isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that God would have mercy on overfed and overpleasurized Americans and say, I will bring you into my church also. While I'm bringing millions of Africans in, and millions of Chinese in, and millions of Latin Americans in. Okay, I'm going to have mercy on Americans too. And I'm going to bring them in because I'm such a wonderful, wonderful Jesus. So Jesus is the head of this amazing new creation called the Church of Jesus. Not a building. Forget the buildings. All, every one, ruined sinners, saved by grace. Number five, he's the conqueror of death. Look at verse uh, 17, verse 18. He's the head of the body of the church, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Here's Jesus, crucified for our sins, risen from the dead. Oh, please believe this. The firstborn from among the dead... A whole new order of glorified creation. And Jesus is leading the way that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He's the origin and ruler of a whole new order. I want to tell you something. If you're a believer in Jesus, you will one day be resurrected in a new and glorified body. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, Jesus will transform our lowly bodies 
to be like His glorious body. You haven't seen the best of me yet, not by a long shot. The best of me is yet to come, and that's the glorious truth for every Christian believer. Amen? Amen. And Jesus is the firstborn of this. Muhammad didn't conquer death. Buddha didn't conquer death. George Washington didn't conquer death. Abraham Lincoln didn't conquer death. Jesus conquered death. And I, this person right here, I get the privilege of being the citizen of two earthly nations. I'm the citizen of the USA, and I'm a citizen of the United Kingdom. A citizen of two nations. But more than that, I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm a redeemed person and bought by the blood of Christ and a citizen of a kingdom that's coming in power. And Jesus has led the way. And that's the Jesus I want to follow. Number four, number Number six, God's fullness dwells in him. Verse 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The Colossians taught, you know, God would never become a human because God would not lower himself that much. But Paul says, no, God was pleased to dwell in Jesus. I will gladly become a human so I can redeem a new humanity. That's what that verse says. I will gladly do this. I want to dwell on earth. Get this. Planet earth has been visited by God. Does that amaze you? The naughty planet. The bad planet. The rebel planet has been visited by God. That's what The Bible teaches. James Irwin, who knows who James Irwin was? Scott? He was an astronaut. He was the eighth man to walk on the moon. The eighth man. He drove a car on the moon, James Irwin did. He came to Jesus on the moon, James Irwin did. In 1973, he came to Jesus He was converted, came to Christ on the moon, and he came back to this planet and he said these words, God walking on the earth is more important than man walking on the moon. Wow, way to go, James. God walking on the earth is more important than man walking on the moon. God came here, fully God and truly human, Jesus. And finally, number seven, he's the redeemer and reconciler. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This Jesus, this Jesus has somehow, and I don't don't know just how it happened. He has reconciled this fractured humanity and this fractured creation to himself through his blood shed on the cross. When Jesus shed his blood on the cross, he paid for the rebellious sins of mankind, and somehow that has not only redeemed us, but is redeeming and reconciling the whole of creation back to him. And it's going to be beautiful, friends. The day is coming when there will be no more sin or mourning, or crying, or pain, or death. Do you know that? There won't be a cemetery in heaven. You'll never hear a siren. There won't be any hospitals. There won't be any COVID. You'll never have to say sorry again. You'll never wake up in the morning saying, why did I do that? It's all going to be gone. And the fractured creation that is groaning will groan no more because Christ shed his blood. Oh, friends, the wonders of Jesus. You cannot think of one more glorious than the one just described in this passage. It is not possible. 
And I want to tell you, friends, I'm so thankful to be an American. I'm also thankful to be a Brit, especially now that they're winning the European Cup. For those of you who care about such things, but I am so much more thankful to be a follower of Jesus. And when every nation is gone and all the kingdoms of the earth are but dust, Jesus will be Lord of all. Lord of all. God, creator of all that there is, firstborn of all creation, head of the church, conqueror of death, the fullness of God dwelling in him and the reconciler of all things by his blood. Do you know this, Jesus? Oh, please know this, Jesus. And may Westbrook Church be known for one thing, our desire to follow Christ and to promote Christ and to live for Christ and to be Jesus' people. 